Hello and welcome to our online service for July for the weekend of July 24th and 25th uh, for the ninth Sunday after Pentecost from Pinnacle Lutheran Church in Rochester, New York. Just a reminder that you can find all of our services online as well as a daily devotional at our website, pinnaclelutheran.org. Our opening hymn today is Lord Jesus Christ, Be Present Now. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. And we make our beginning today in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Since the beginning of time, God has revealed His will to seek and to save that which was lost. No matter how often we have entered the gates of God's place, whether often or rarely, because of sin, we are all lost and on our own and helpless. Let us therefore approach God in humility and receive His forgiveness. O oh God, God, I believe, believe in You, O Lord. Lord. I, trust I trust Your promise to save, to save me. me. Forgive, Forgive me for my sins, sins in thought, thought, word, and deed. deed. Come, Come to me, though I am not worthy. Come, Come to me, to me with, your with Your promise, with Your touch of forgiveness, healing, help, and life. Come, Come Lord Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. God has come to you and called you in grace and mercy. Upon this, your confession, and as a called and ordained servant of the Word and by His authority, I forgive you all your sin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our service continues today with our psalm, which we'll read responsibly. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. For his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who by understanding made the heavens for his steadfast, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who spread out the earth above the waters, for his steadfast love endures forever. To him who made the great lights, for his steadfast love endures forever. The sun to rule over the day, for his steadfast love endures forever. The moon and the stars to rule over the night, for his steadfast love endures forever. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace in our hearts and calm in our nation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, mercy. have mercy. For peace among nations, growth in the church, unity of faith, and proclamation among all believers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. For ourselves gathered here and all who join us wherever they are, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. Help us in our weakness. Comfort us in our setbacks and defend us from all evil, gracious Lord. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with, with you. you. Let us pray. O God, our Redeemer, according to your gracious promises and gift of salvation, help us now in any anxiety or fear to believe in your love and power to deliver us and restore to us your gift of life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our service continues today with our readings. God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark, it is for every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off of the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you. For all, 
future generations, I have set my bow bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth, and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you, and every living creature of all flesh. And the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all the flesh the flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will set it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is in the earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on earth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. We speak to gradual and unison. Over oh, the depths, the depths of, of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. God. How unsearchable are his judgments, judgments and, and how inscrutable his ways. ways. For, For from him and through him and to him, him, and to him are all things. To him, to him be glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that is according to the riches of his glory, may he grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints that is the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, and that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. We read the verse in unison. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Take Take it heart. It is I. It is I. Do Do not not be afraid. afraid. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, For all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them. And the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him and ran about the whole region and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or the countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Our hymn of the day today is beautiful Savior. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as we look at our readings this week, I think especially when we look at our Gospel lesson, we're tempted to look at our Gospel lesson especially and I think in many ways related to us. Everything that we see happening in the Gospel, we tend to analogize. We tend to say, okay, what is this a metaphor 
for. And what I find is that people are by nature selfish. Whether we're Christian or not, we want all the world, we want all of its stories to revolve around us. And our Gospel lesson is no exception. We want all of these stories, all of these narratives to address some inner need, some struggle that we have. And we think about the number of ways that we do this even outside of Scripture. Think about it. In the modern world, our jobs are good for us as long as they're satisfying and they meet our needs. Gone are the days um, of yesteryear where it was enough just to be paid. Why did you work? Well, you worked because you got paid. If you liked your job, they would have given it to you for free. But now because they pay you, that was reward enough. But nowadays, it seems that people are looking for something more even out of their jobs, like happiness or, or self-worth. And just for an example, my grandfather came over from Lithuania. And he was apprenticed in Lithuania as a tailor. But when he came here to America, he found himself working in coal mines. And he worked in the coal mines of Pennsylvania for his entire career, 12 hours a day, uh, six days a week. I never got the chance to meet my grandfather. I never got a chance to ask him anything. But my guess is he wouldn't have told me in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s that this was his dream job that gave him personal fulfillment, um, that he was self-actualized by being a coal miner. He worked because he had to eat. He worked because his family had to eat. His family had to live. It was enough that he was paid and it, it allowed him to raise his children. And yet, not two generations separated from my grandfather to me, I find it very difficult to not want something more out of my life. My work ethic suddenly looks a whole lot more like 21st century America than mid-20th century America, where I want something more. I want my job to be fulfilling. I want some sort of happiness to accrue from my work. So again, my job suddenly says something about me, says something about who I am. Our conversations are very similar to that. Um, We take our conversations as opportunities Um, to relate to others what we think or what we know about or what we've done in our lives. It's like a game of one-upmanship. And uh, you see it when you're at family reunions or you see it um, at social events at church where you hear people trying to impress other people that they either don't know very well or don't know at all by telling them all about themselves. Right? You should like me because this is what I've done, this is who I am, these are my accomplishments. And it's almost a narcissistic type of a, type of a drive. And even some of our songs have captured this. Now, I don't know how many of you listen to country music, but there's a country, music, country musician known, named Toby Keith. And he had, a, he had a song a couple of years ago that went like this. We talk about your friends and the places that you've been, the polish on your toes and the run in your hose, and God knows we're going to talk about your clothes. But every once in a while, I want to talk about me. I want to talk about I. I want to talk about number one, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. I like talking about you, 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 you usually, but occasionally, I want to talk about me. But when it really comes right down to it, there's nothing occasional about our desire to talk about ourselves. What we think, what we talk about, what we do, almost always revolves around me. It's almost always about me. And even, and as I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, even the way we interpret Scripture, the way that we approach narratives in Scripture, events like we see in our Gospel lesson today, we somehow immediately have to try to figure out how we can make it about me. Um, forget about what the passage really means in context. Forget about what God might actually try, might be trying to say through the passage. How does a passage, how do the events in this passage suddenly relate to me? How does it apply to my life today? And as I mentioned in today's Gospel lesson, it's a case in point. Because if you look at the number of sermons and studies that have been written on this passage in Mark 6, where our Lord comes walking across the water in the midst of the storm and calms the storm, immediately most, most pastors and theologians will move to analogy. So the disciples, they, they'll say something like the disciples' passage across the Sea of Galilee is really about the Christian's journey through life. 
the headwinds that they encountered as the boat was about to sink is really the struggles that we go through in our own lives. And Jesus walking on the water to come out to the boat is God coming to help us in the midst of our storms. And I won't argue that it's, that it's always wrong to allegorize Scripture because I don't know that it's really wrong to allegorize Scripture so that it relates to our lives, but sometimes, just every once in a while, it's necessary to step back from the text and realize that maybe, just maybe, it's not all about you. Maybe it's not always about me or my world. We have to ask ourselves, when we look at events like this in our Gospel lesson, is that what the disciples understood? Right? Is, is that what Christ was intending to convey? Right? Is that what the apostles saw as they were journeying across the, the Sea of Galilee? So let's just put it in context the events of our Gospel lesson. This happens just after our Lord finished feeding the 5,000. And that was a clear demonstration that, of, that God had come down and was in the midst of His people. Clearly, God was able to multiply the loaves and the fish from one small boy's lunch to be able to feed 5,000 people. He had previously sent the 12 out into the, into the nation of Israel to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out demons. And He had given them authority, His authority, His power, in order to do that once again. A demonstration that God was active among His people. That Yahweh, the God of Israel, had come down. And He had already calmed another storm. This wasn't the first storm on the sea that He had calmed. Um, in short, what we have seen in Mark's Gospel up to this point reveals that Jesus is God and He is the God who controls and directs creation. He is the God who is omnipotent and He can do whatever He wants in His world. Did the disciples stop to think as they were crossing the Sea of Galilee in their boat? Oh, our troubles getting across the Sea of Galilee in the middle of the night is a perfect metaphor for the struggles that we have in life. That's exactly what I was thinking, right? All the times that I struggled fishing and all the times that I struggled in my carpentry practice or in the tax collector business, Matthew might have said, and this is all a metaphor for the struggles that I've had in my life. No. No, Scripture plainly tells us in our, in our reading today that they were even more terrified of Jesus walking on the water than they were of the storm that was, that was brewing around them. As Mark reports, when they saw Him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. And when the episode was done, they didn't pause to reflect again and talk about how this is going to be appropriate for all the people who are going to follow in faith and wonder about how this relates to the struggles that they have in their life. They weren't thinking that at all. Again, as Mark tells us, he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves and their hearts were hardened. There wasn't a moment of self-reflection. There wasn't a moment where the disciples said, gee, this is going to be useful for somebody going through struggles or problems in their life. They had no idea what had just happened. They were utterly amazed and they weren't of a mind to allegorize the events or any of Jesus' miracles because they didn't understand them. They were in awe. But the episode, again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, was a demonstration that Yahweh, the Old Testament God of Israel, the one who created heavens and earth with His Word, was present. When our Lord said to the disciples, it is I, He was using a very specific reference to His divinity. So this goes back to the Old Testament. When God revealed His name, to Moses in the burning bush back in Exodus chapter 3, he revealed his name as Yahweh in Hebrew. That's where we get God's name, Yahweh. In Greek, in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that's translated as ego I me. And that is what our Lord says as he walks out on the water. He, sa he doesn't say it is I. He says ego I me, which is I am. No one in Scripture uses that construction. That construction, ego I me, I am, is only used of God. And so when Jesus says, it is I, or ego I me, he's using the divine name. He is claiming at that moment, in the middle of the storm, God is present right here. And this is one of the rare times in the synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, 
where we see that phrase being used. For those of you who had gone to our Bible study um, a couple of months ago on John, we see that construction, ego I me, quite a bit in the Gospel of John, where Jesus repeatedly identifies himself or equates himself with God. But the disciples didn't recognize any of that. Even when Jesus used God's name in reference to himself, because they, as Mark tells us, their hearts were hardened. They weren't thinking in those terms. And we too, I think, reveal our hardness of heart when we have to make all of the miracles and all the events of Christ's life about us and our problems in order to relate to them. Isn't it enough that we see that the God who created the heavens and the earth is here among us exercising his power and divinity on behalf of us? No, for once it's not important what we've done, what we think, how you feel or what you know. It's all about Christ. It's all about him. It's all about God coming down to be among his people. He is God in flesh. He was born of a woman who was born under the law to redeem, that is to buy back or save those of us who are under the law, sinners. He lived a life fulfilling all of God's law, which was nothing more than his law. Right? Jesus, as God's son, bound himself to live under the laws that he gave his people. Where we couldn't, where we couldn't fulfill the law, he fulfilled it perfectly. He died on a cross as punishment for my sins, for your sins, for the sins of the entire world. And the whole story of salvation is already all about you. The entire story of salvation is already all about us. It's already all about me. So why then, when everything that He's done, He did for us, why do we take the demonstrations of His divine power and make them so, and reduce them to being all about us as well? Why do we have to take them and make them relatable to us? Isn't it enough just to marvel at what our Lord is doing on behalf of His creation rather than trying to reduce it to what it means to me? My brothers and sisters, rejoice and be glad that this Almighty God, whose appearance frightened His closest friends, loved you enough to save you. Is He there for you in times of trouble? Of course he is. Do we have to jump to Mark 6 as he crosses the Sea of Galilee in the middle of a storm to know that? No, we don't. We see that throughout Scripture. We don't have to allegorize what our Lord did to be about us. It's enough. Listen to Romans 8 and what Paul says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. No, in all of these things, we are more. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. We don't need to invent a Christ who cares for us in, in times of trouble. That promise is writ large throughout Scripture. What our, Lord, what our Lord did couldn't be summed up any better than in the words of John 3.16. For God so loved the world. You could put yourself in there. For God so loved you. For God so loved me. For God so loved the world that He gave. That is, He handed over His Son so that whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. And that same God who spoke everything into existence with His Word is the same God who looked on His fallen creation in love and once again sent His Word, His Word being His Son, Jesus, the Word of God, to save that creation. The story of salvation, my brothers and sisters, is already all about you. So when Christ does choose to reveal Himself for who He is, God in flesh made manifest, it behooves us to be still and know that He is God. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit keep your hearts and minds in faith to life everlasting. Amen. Our service continues today with a creed. We confess the Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed as they are printed. I believe, I believe in one God, God, the Father Almighty, Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, 
begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, light, of light very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one, one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. 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 And let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Eternal Father, O God, our Creator and Redeemer, we thank You that You have drawn us to Yourself by the power of Your Word and our Savior Jesus Christ. For Your promises of life and salvation, we give You praise and adoration as our God and our Lord. We pray that You would keep us in steady faith in You that you would guide our steps in the ways of your life-giving word, and that you would make us to be evermore your people of hope, love, and life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, as you strengthened your early apostles by your presence, so give strength and courage to church workers who continue in your service to this day. Guard and protect them from the assaults of the devil and bless their service in your word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord, You are able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. Be glorified in Your church and in Christ Jesus. Ground us in love. Give us a faith rooted in the promises of Christ. And give us strength to comprehend with all the saints His love that surpasses knowledge. Lord, in Your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Heavenly Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, as you preserved Noah and his family and brought forth new life from the ark under the promise of your covenant, bless now our families also. Make marriages strong and fruitful according to your will. Let your word rule in every home, uniting its members in forgiveness and causing your Son to dwell in every heart through faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. And Lord of might, Spare us and future generations from wickedness. Give blessings to our nation and its leaders to rule according to your good pleasure. Protect the members of our armed forces, our police, and other public servants. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, through your Son, his reconciling death, we receive all good gifts, healing and sustenance, and we bring before you the sick and those who are in need, especially those listed in our prayer list, and those we bring before you in our hearts. Give them healing and protection and encourage them in the midst of this life by the recognition of your fatherly providence known in Christ our Savior. Lord, in your mercy. Hear, hear our prayer. prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, who art, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in You, 
Strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in Your love, You will rescue us from all adversity. Through Jesus Christ, Your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with You and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you His peace. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. And our closing hymn today is Jesus Lead Thou On. Please pause the service video and click the hymn link below.